We still have folks entering the webinar, so it'll be just a moment. Hi, everyone. I'm Kelly Redder, Executive Director of the Joseph M. Labazo Alumni House on the RIT campus. While the house is currently closed through to July 1st, 2021, we are actually taking reservations for beyond that. And I encourage you to check out our website in the chat box as you think about your future family gatherings, reunions, weddings, retirements, business meetings, and conferences. A visit's a wonderful way to reacclimate to RIT, and as you can see behind me, the sun is always shining here. Many in our RIT family have asked how they can help our students and the university in light of all that's happening in the world this past year. We're incredibly grateful for those offers, and there are two ways you can help. First, our new graduates and current students are seeking positions for full-time careers and co-ops. If your company's hiring, please contact RIT's Career Services Office and allow them to post that position in our systems. In addition, there's now an unprecedented need for financial aid scholarships for both our in-person and virtual Tiger students. In honor of our special guest tonight, we'd like to highlight the GO Grant, the Liberal Arts Travel Grant, which encompasses support for international exchange programs and students. It's an automatic grant for all College of Liberal Arts majors and double majors going on RIT global campus exchanges, faculty led or research programs. Note that support of this area will be counted in RIT's historic billion dollar campaign, which has reached the $750 million mark. If you are able, please make a gift at the link in the chat box. Thank you. Now, just a few housekeeping things. All attendees have joined in mute mode. However, your questions can be entered in the chat or question boxes at any time throughout the discussion. We'll make every effort to address all your comments and questions throughout the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be shared with you in the coming weeks. If you have any technical questions, please feel free to type those into the chat box as well, and we'll do our best to get to the appropriate answers. Tonight's event is sponsored by the Labazo Alumni House as part of the Alumni Actor, Artist, and Author Series, celebrating alumni who have found success in their passion for the liberal, performing, fine, and literary arts. I first had the opportunity to meet Olga over lunch in the Crossroads Building on campus. My colleague, Sharon Lanther of our University Advancement Division mentioned that she had a rock star writer she wanted me to meet. I wondered at the time what a rock star writer was and was looking forward to hearing her story. I so enjoyed meeting her, hearing her story, stories and subsequently reading her book. Um, and I thought she needed to be shared with our Tiger friends as part of the alumni actor, artist and author series. Olga Zilberberg's collection, like Water and other stories, contain protagonists whose identity is always in flux, transitioning between various contexts such as emigration, motherhood, partnership, and employment, much like Olga herself. This is her first book to appear in English. Raised in Leningrad, St. Petersburg, Russia, she has published three collections of stories in Russian. Her short fiction has appeared in Bear Life Review, Scoundrel Time, Alaska Quarterly Review, Feminist Studies, Confrontation, World Literature Today, Tin Houses, The Open Bar, narrative magazine, and other print and online publications. Essays and book reviews have been in Lit Hub, The Believer, San Francisco Chronicle, Electric Literature, The Common, and elsewhere. She serves as a consulting editor at Narrative Magazine and as a co-facilitator of the San Francisco Writers' Workshop, as well as a co-founder of Punctured Lines, a feminist blog about Russian literature. 
She holds a master's degree in comparative literature from San Francisco State University and a bachelor's in international business from our very own RIT. Olga currently resides in San Francisco with her family and is joining us live from there this evening. Olga, take it away. Our Tiger audience is all yours. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, uh, Sharon, who I, I see is here too. It's, a, it's such a pleasure to be here and it's such a, a wonderful opportunity to share my work with uh, some of my RET peers. Um, and, and others, Every, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I, um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so let me first start with that. Um, whoops, I think I shared the wrong screen. <laughs> let me try this again. Okay. Can you now see the? Yes, uh, we can see it, Olga. The present, the um, and then now the second screen of my presentation. Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you You're so much. Awesome. Okay. Great. Um. This. All right. Thanks again for for being here, and I'll just launch right right into my my presentation. So I want to paint a scene for you from before the pandemic times. Imagine that you are in San Francisco on a Tuesday night. It is 7 p.m. and you are entering a bookstore in the Mission District. The neighborhood uh, that historically was the center of the city's Mexican-American community is lit up by store windows and signs. The street is decorated with colorful paper hangings, overgrown ficus trees uh, providing a canopy overhead and aroma of delectable food and drink hangs in the cool air. On the way to the bookstore, you've picked up pan dulce, a Mexican sweetbreads, and you're planning to chase them with a burrito and beer afterwards. At the bookstore, you ask about a writing workshop and are directed to the back of the store, doubling as an art gallery. You can see the, the art gallery on, on, the, on the slide. It's, it's an open, unheated space with art by local artists on the wall and chairs that are arranged in a circle in the middle. You pick a seat and try to figure out what to do next. Finally, a brown haired white woman wearing glasses, much like myself, uh, announces her, herself as a moderator. And I'm one of the co-moderators. Um, there are four of us at the San Francisco Writing Workshop right now. Speaking with a vague uh, Russian accent, she explains the rules of the workshop and asks how many pages you've brought to read. You realize that not only you're going to have to read the first chapter of a novel you've been working on for the past decade in the privacy of your own living room, now out loud, but also that total strangers are going to comment on your work afterwards. That burrito time can't come soon enough. I wanted to start with a scene to illustrate the simple fact. Creative writing is intimidating. Sharing your writing with strangers is doubly so. Whether or not you've ever shared your writing with anyone, if you think about it, you might realize what I did when I first started coming to the San Francisco Writers Workshop 14 years ago, that the scariest part of, the, of writing is not other people's judgment of it. Uh, for me, it was me, my own judgment of my work. People gathered in the room that day were actually quite nice and encouraging, but I was my own hard, harshest critic. When I heard that novel draft in my own voice, I felt that it was off. My, ideed, my ideas didn't gel into a convincing story. I realized just how much I had to still learn about writing. I decided to go back to the drawing board. And I know that many people uh, sh sharing their work for the first time end up doing the same thing. We stop writing. I fell back to reading. Wanting to get better at writing, I went back to graduate school for literature and took some time off from writing. However, writing is both art and craft. And the thing is, to master the craft, you have to practice it. And before you judge yourself too harshly, let me remind you that you do have 
great stories to tell. And I'm reminding this to you, know, to, to you and to myself every day when I face that blank page, um, that each one of us has the stories that only we can tell uh, in our own words that reflect our own sensibilities and point of view. Things that happen to you and things that you wish would happen or that you wish never did. Lots of things. So here's my advice. Start with a flash. It illuminates everything, if briefly. I'll tell you another quick story. Back in 2000, when I graduated from RIT, uh, I got a job doing market research in a small company based in Concord, Massachusetts. The office building was located right in the town central square between the church and the funeral parlor. I was super lucky to get that job. I had been an international student and the job market for business people without permanent residence wasn't exactly booming. I was good at my job and had a great rapport with my bosses. The, the company was run by two women, former execs, who had seen the top of the corporate ladder and decided to go into business for themselves. I knew I was lucky to be where I was. And yet every day when I came to the office, I couldn't stop staring at the wall of the funeral parlor and think, is this all that life has to offer? I was 21. I didn't really know anyone in Massachusetts except my husband, um, well, my boyfriend at the time, and my main hobby was reading. At some point, I discovered Walden P P Pond. You may know uh, Walden Pond from the eponymous book by Henry David Thoreau, where he reflects on simple living in a natural world. I discovered it was a popular gathering spot for the local Russian community. The beach was populated by families with parents yelling at their kids in Russian to come out of the water and to stop fighting. After work, I drove out there and read both comforted and disturbed by the sound of my native language. It, it wasn't too long afterwards that I started to write my first novel. The premise of that work was that during a corporate picnic, a young employee quits her job on the spot, gets in her car and leaves town without saying goodbye to anyone, including her husband. She drives off west without as much as taking a toothbrush with her. I spent many months working on this idea before I realized I didn't know much about writing a novel. So let me just repeat this again. Start with a flash. Uh, that was the magic trick that eventually helped me to move past my fears of writing and got me to actually start writing. So what is flash? Uh, one definition that I like for it comes from Rose Metal Press's Field Guide to Writing Flash Fiction. Flash is a work of art carved on a grain of rice. Flash is an extremely versatile form that is typically defined in terms of its um, super short length. It can be anywhere um, from a few words to a few paragraphs to a couple of pages. It accommodates various styles from a prose poem to a compressed short story and everything in bet between. Do you have a penchant for lyric or for humor? Do you love a strong character and a well-developed plot? Or do you get stuck on sentences and obsess about individual words? Flash has room for plot and that perfectly written sentence and a well-chosen word can be flash. Here's a range of the possibilities for flash fiction taken from the Rose Metal Press Guide. We now have uh, 50 word stories, dribbles, 55 word stories, sometimes termed nanofiction, 100 stories, drabbles, quick fiction, fast fiction, micro fiction, furious fiction, sudden and flash fiction, postcard fiction, napkin fiction, mi minute long stories, smoke long stories, skinny stories, vest pocket stories, and pill size stories, um, pocket stories, pop size stories. And you know what? I think if you invent a new name for a flash fiction genre, that could be flash fiction. Um, so Narrative Magazine, where I still serve as a consulting e editor, 
regularly publishes two categories of flash, a six word story and what they call an I story, a 150 word story. Here are a few, here are a few examples. Um, so this, this story uh, is called 1968 by J Jane Seskin and it, uh, it is met at, a, met at a demonstration, married, still protesting. And then um, I have another example of a six word story by Marlon Jimenez. Um, it's called Shy, sitting next to her, saying nothing. And the note underneath says that this was Marlon's, uh, Marlon Jimenez's first publication and he wrote it in eighth grade. And then you know, here's, um, here's an I story um, that's 150 words by Michael Crowley. And it's called One Such As This. And I'll, I'll just read it. Um, after the bars are closed and the restaurants shut down, after the last of the fluorescent disappears into darkness and all that's left are a few neon beacons on what were once crowded streets, I hear wind created by cars, tires strumming pavement. And I think of that night, one such as this, with our backs against the brick wall in the alley, the shared flame of my Zippo and the quick brush of your fingers along mine. Sometime later in the pale of dawn, your hair brushed across my forearm. You eased the chain from its lock where it tapped against the wood, keeping time with the clicking of your heels, resting only with the turn of your engine. After you were gone, I opened my eyes to the stillness, to the hollow room where we had only been shadows. So that's, I, I chose the story in part because how well it reflects the, you know, it, it, it has a feeling of the quarantine times, even though it's clearly was written before that. Um, so uh, one thing that I love about Flash is that, um, well, it's important to note that it's a very, long tradition. If you think about it, Flash is as ubiquitous as storytelling itself. In fact, I would argue that it is the novel that is a recent genre, um, that, that the novel came to prominence in the last uh, couple of centuries, but Flash can be found in oral traditions, the myths and the Iliad and Odyssey, Ace of Fables, the fables of the Middle East and fairy tales. Um, Russian literature is known for its long novels, but actually growing up, I loved reading um, short, short fictions. Russian literature is rife with them. And not only with short fictions, but also with very short fictions. So Chekhov is well known, of course, um, but he's far from alone. Turgenev and the novelist, for instance, wrote what he called prose poems later in his life and rereading them, um, uh, they feel extremely contemporary today. There, there, there were many others. Um, I particularly enjoyed the 20th century lit literature and uh, some names uh, from uh, Russian 20th century uh, short fiction writers, uh, Zoshenko, Averchenko, Tefi, Davlatov. Of the contemporary Russian authors, uh, Ludmila Petrushevska and Lenor Garalik, uh, masters of the genre. And look, look at almost any place in the world, I'm, I'm sure you'll be able to find examples sharing as many similarities as differences as do our languages. In China, the form was known as smoke long stories. A flash takes as long to read as it does to smoke a cigarette. Yosemari Kawabata in Japan was famous for his palm of the hand stories. Jorge Luis Borges in Argentina, uh, Robert Walzer in Switzerland, Collette in France, Isaac Dennison in Denmark and so on. In the US, um, from the guides that I, um, the flash fiction guides that I found, the, the uh, genealogy of the flash um, people um, ad, uh, attributed to Walt Whitman, Ambrose Beers, uh, O. Henry Louisa May Alcott, and Kate Chop Chopin. Um, and um, in the ninth, in the 20s, um, the short, short, story form was associated with Cosmopolitan magazine. Uh, Ernest Hemingway, known best for his novels, uh, wrote 18 pieces of very short fiction that were included in his collection in our time. 
so, and people who theorize flash as a genre talk about how the flash went out of style uh, for a considerable period of time in mid 20th century. And they credit the internet and social media for popularizing the form again. Uh, there are now hundreds of journals, competitions, collections, and anthologies that include or focus exclusively on Flash. So though Flash has existed for a long time, it is now becoming recognized as a separate genre. And I should mention two of my personal favorite Flash pieces uh, that come from the second half of the 20th century, Jamaica Kincaid's Girl and Lydia Davis's Foucault and Pencil. Um, one other point I want to make today is that Flash is particularly well suited for people who are coming to writing later in life and having a myriad of life experiences to share. Few of us come to writing knowing all the tricks, how to write an engaging character that a reader will want to spend time with, how to develop the scene and write convincing dialogue, how to move the reader emotionally and engage her intellectually. The craft of writing, professional creative writing, takes years to, to develop. Writing Flash allows you to break the learning into bite-sized pieces. You don't have to learn it all at once. You can throw a flash of color on the page and then figure out what you need to know to make this piece more vivid. Most advice about how to become Excuse a better- me. Olga, sure. yes. Uh, before we, we before we move on to the next slide, um, I have a question here that says, "Thank you for mentioning the phrase prose poems." Uh, she's been reflecting on the relationship between poetry and flash fiction, short stories too, and would love to hear uh, more of your thoughts on prose poems. Um. Well, you know, that's, uh, that's a really interesting term. Um, it's, um, well, the interesting part for me at the moment is um, to, the way Turgenev used it, uh, the, the writer, uh, the Russian writer mentioned, he, um, I think he used it uh, to describe his pieces that contained a scene but didn't develop the character and didn't have any plot. So for instance, he has one story that is his encounter with uh, an old woman and the old woman is clearly representing death and she's chasing after him, um, basically looking for him at different um, uh, moments in his life, trying to catch him and grab him and, and um, get him into his grave. Um, it's, it's, it's a pretty striking piece and it's only about this long, um, but it is, it's very prosaic. It, um, it doesn't really have the typical poetic qualities, but, but it doesn't really have mm, any ca named characters. It doesn't really have a plot. Uh, it just has this, this sort of, mm, fable-like or experience. So, Prose poem, um, a lot of the uh, times in English when we see that uh, you usually, uh, we usually talk about write a text that's arranged in a paragraph and usually the language is poetic in some form. There, there's alliteration or use of, um, you know, specific language based um, you know, phrases that, that out, the language that amplifies the sound, the sound qualities are amplified. Um, and, but, but when we're talking about prose poem as a genre of flash fiction, that kind of opens up what, what that means, that the prose poem can be a genre of poetry and it can be a genre of flash. And um, yeah, and so that's, it, it, as a genre of flash, it's, uh, it has different requirements uh, than, uh, and different possibilities, opportunities um, to it than, than the poetic uh, genre. So it can be poetic in a creative way. And, uh, you know, and um, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, oh, there, there's a quite a range of possibilities there. So I'll- um, Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, 
And I just have uh, one other quick sure. uh, observation, please. Is would you mind slowing down a little bit? <laughs> <It's> just, oh, sure. <laughs> Thanks. Um, You're so excited, and I'm so excited, and and, and we're we're following you. Um, we just want to make sure that our closed captionist is able to uh, keep up with you a little bit. Okay. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Okay. And proceed. Okay. All right. So yeah. Um, so most advice about how to become a better creative writer, um, I think, can be boiled down to three skills. You have to learn how to read as a writer. Um, and what that means is how to pay attention to devices that authors use um, to allow the reader in, the emotional and intellectual experience that they desire. And then when you come to the page, you have to be able to separate the creative process from the process of revision. First, you have to allow your thoughts to flow on the page. Um, and and you, as, as, po as <laughs> if possible, you have to do that uncritically. And then later, um, you have to be able to step away from what feels very personal and look at what you've written as an outsider, able to cut the unnecessary bits and fill in the gaps. Um, make it clear to to um, to a reader. So, but I really want to emphasize that those are really different parts of the process, the, the writing and the re revision part. Um, and, and writing flash, I think, is a great way to practice all three. Um, I, I personally, I began writing um, every day as a job back in 2003 when my husband and I moved to San Francisco. I went to a cafe that's unfortunately no longer there. And since I had my, my, my particular hang up, one of my hang ups was revising. I, I let myself off the hook. I decided that I won't revise. Every day I wrote a new story. The, new, the next day, I didn't go back to look at what I wrote the day before, but started with a fresh idea, a fresh approach. I went on like this for about three months before I started to be curious and really wanted to, to know what I'd written before. And I went back into the manuscript and uh, reread. Uh, I found that by then I'd forgotten a lot of what I'd written and that I could approach uh, my work with fresh eyes as an editor so I could cut the things that felt repetitive and unnecessary and add the things that felt like they were missing. And so based on this experience, for those of you who are interested in writing, here's a writing pattern that I, rec uh, that I uh, would recommend for you to try. So spend 30 days setting yourself only reading goals. Read one piece of flash fiction a day. Um, don't use the same source. Buy, find different venues, different uh, sources of flash fictions for a greater range of examples. Like, you know, read only prose poetry, uh, but read prose poems and read prose poem <laughs> flashes. Um, if a story gives you ideas for a piece that you might want to write, jot that down. And then for the next, 30 days, commit to writing one piece of flash fiction a day. If you have 15 minutes in a day to write, write a paragraph. If you have five minutes, write six words. Feel free to use the ideas you've jotted down in the uh, earlier or use the day's experience as a writing prompt. Did something annoy you today? Did something make you exhilaratingly happy? Did you have a vivid dream <laughs> or a waking fantasy? What is it that you've been, you've always been wanting to write but afraid to tackle because it's so huge? And my suggestion, do what feels easy and fun. Don't worry about doing the things that feel hard to do on the page. And don't revise during these 30 days. Don't even look at, <laughs> at the pages you've written. Then uh, the next 30 days, um, go back to reading. 
uh, and then and take take a break from from writing if you want to, um, or you can keep writing. Uh, but whatever you do, don't revise. And um, just FYI, the math on uh, on the the slide is not going to add, add up, and that's intentionally. I find it important. I find it is important to build flexibility into my plans. Plan plans get get amended along the way. Um, so, at the end of this, you know, once enough time has passed that you've forgotten <laughs> uh, what what you've written in the first day, go back into your doc and see what you've got. Allow yourself to enjoy your own words. Allow yourself to cut them when they bring you no satisfaction. Most professional writers will tell you that the hardest work and the most creative will happen in revision. This is where the uh, books on craft will come in handy. There are lots of them and lots of great ones, but I just want to reinforce this idea. Craft books won't give you better ideas or ideas for better stories. They won't make you better writers. They will just teach you what style of writing is currently in vogue in, in the publishing industry and how to produce the writing that most magazines and publishers will want to publish. There's a difference between being a good writer and knowing how to market yourself. It's an important difference to remember once you start sending your work out there. Good writing is indeed deeply personal and publishing is not. Publishing is a business. And uh, yeah, so here are a few book recommendations. Um, these are the craft books and how-to guides and anthologies of flash fiction. Um, I will particularly recommend Flash Fiction International, the very uh, short stories uh, from around the world. Um, it starts by one of my favorite uh, flash, contemporary flash authors, the Israeli author Edgar Carrot. Uh, he, he's really uh, funny and interesting. Um, and then there is the Best Small Fictions Anthology with the Purple People. Uh, that's an annual anthology, so it com comes out um, about once a year. And then um, the Nancy Stolman's book is the guide, um, is, is a very good guide, uh, how, how to a craft book. Uh, and the right and the Rose Metal Press has not only the guide for writing flash fiction, but also flash nonfiction. Um, and the, both of those books contain prompts. So, like, if you're having, uh, if 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 it's um, if, if uh, prompts are a really great way to um, to um, get started uh, on flash fiction. And and the, those books have wonderful ones. Um, and here are a few online venues that publish excellent flash fictions that you can um, read, and they're very different. Uh, from one another. So there's um, the uh, 100 word story um, in the corner and they also published uh, an anthology recently, nothing short of 100. Uh, Split uh, Lip Magazine, Smoke Long Quarterly, um, American Short Fiction, Atticus Review and Wiggly. And these are just the ones that, that fit you know, on the slide, but there are so many others. So um, uh, my next thing uh, I was gonna uh, read read to you from my my collection. I, I'll read a few examples of Flash. My collection has Flash and uh, longer stories, but I'll, I'll focus today on Flash. Um, for background, this is my fourth book of stories. The first three were published in Russian in Russian, um, and in this collection there are 52 stories altogether. Um, I, um, for this book, I decided to use flash fiction a little differently. Typically, a piece of flash is expected to stand alone as a complete story. These pieces do too, though I've intentionally used some of them as glue, as moments of transition from one longer story to the next. So I'm asking them to do two things at once. It's um, possible to read individual stories from the book as standalone pieces, but I also uh, think if you read the book from the, from, from the beginning to the end, uh, it, it does read um, together as one, um, as, a, as a book, 
as a it, well, they, they add to each other yeah sorry to interrupt um, and, we do have a question from Evelyn. She's curious how you would apply the recommendations that you made uh, regarding flash fiction to writers working on longer forms, uh, short stories, a novel. That, uh, <laughs> that's another that's another great question. Um, it's it's um, it's um, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think it is really critical to separate the writing from the, the process of writing from the process of rereading critically. And I think one of the trouble with novels, or at least the one major trouble that I personally have encountered is with, with the novel, when it's hard to keep going, it's hard to Get, go back to the page and keep going simply because you're forced, you, you're constantly forced to re look back at your own writing. You have to keep the story in your head, which means you're, you're always in your head thinking about the story, you know, and whether it's good enough or whatnot. Um, so the, there are, you know, some tricks people I've heard people use is that, you know, it's a contemporary problem that's in part born from us working on the computer on these things. And when you open the computer, it opens the file at the beginning and you have to scroll, scroll down. So the, 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 the word now does allow you to go back to the place in the document where um, you left off. But I, it's, it's in part a mechanical problem. So if, if there, the, the, in part, the answer is simply mechanical. Don't look back <laughs> and keep going. And uh, but but obviously it becomes also a psychological answer. So my other answer to that is, um, it's it's really um, you know it's good to have practice of revising yourself. It's good to have practice of both. Um, Free writing and revising is separate processes. So some people um, have free writing period uh, in the before they they go go into the novel writing period just to flex that muscle of just free writing, throwing the ideas on the page. So that's another another way of um, uh, attempting that. So <laughs> great, Olga. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I think what we'll do is, as people have questions, I'll just collect them. And when you're done reading uh, from like uh, like water, uh, then I'll then we'll sort of hit you with all of them. And I think I'll start with just reading the first two pieces of what I've I've been planning to read, and then if I, I have time, I'll read some more. So, okay, great. Thank you. So I'll I'll start with. Her left side. This is the second uh, second story from the book. Teaching herself to fall asleep on her left side in the early weeks of pregnancy, she spent what seemed like days in bed with her eyes closed planning breakfast. She was torn between a porridge of roasted buckwheat groats that she bought at the Russian store topped with milk and slices of boiled beef frank, and an American-style omelet with bacon, cheese, and ham. What would bring her more comfort? For the baby's sake, she needed vegetables in her diet. Vegetables. As a child with a couch for a bed, she had been taught to sleep on her right side. Her grandparents all three of them, serdechniki, sufferers of heart disease, taught her to avoid the left side, to avoid putting weight on her heart. She now lay on her left side as recommended by the American Pregnancy Association and worried about breakfast. She pictured adding a single slice of tomato to her sandwich, a mistake bile seeped into her mouth. The baby would be a boy, she was sure, a dark-haired child after her grandfather. In bad temper, she would throw dishes across the room and blame her for the ills of the world. 
So that, that's one piece. Um, and the next piece I'll read is called Graduate School. And that's, I think it's the fourth or fifth piece um, here. The English department had a stench to it. It was the morning after spring break and Sonia had put off grading the essays far too long. She sat down in the faculty reading room where people could see her at work and pulled out a green pen. Her comments would be generous, insightful, plainly phrased, but the essays were awful. One 18 year old argued that people who didn't believe in God were inviting misery and suffering into their lives. Another, a young man wrote, thus school uniforms are necessary to protect women from dressing however they want for their own good. Sonia lifted her head. The reading room was empty. That afternoon, a biohazard truck obstructed the exit from the humanities building. Sonia went home to drink wine and read her email. She'd been collecting rejection letters from the PhD programs she'd applied to. Waiting in her inbox was the last of the bunch. A PhD in literature was likely to land her six years later in the same job, grading the same essays. The only difference would be that a PhD made her eligible for a tenure track position. She would never see the end to grading. Perhaps these rejections were a blessing in disguise. It was time to move on from teaching. Once she'd held a position in market research. Returning to that work, she could quadruple her income while regaining her nights and weekends. She could. She opened the email. It was an acceptance. Sonia had been accepted to a comparative literature program, full funding for two years, a rural town across the country known for heavy snowstorms, star faculty, a small program that encouraged cross-departmental collaboration, opportunity to apply for funding to study abroad. We were impressed with your writing sample and would love to have you. The last email in Sonia's inbox was from the president of the university where she was an adjunct. He was saddened to inform the dear campus community that a faculty member had been found dead in her office in the humanities building. Deborah Polk, 62 years old, had contributed to the university's success for the past 29 years the university police chief said that the death appeared to have been the result of natural causes. Deborah had no immediate family. Short-term counseling was available for employees, including adjunct instructors through Life Matters, the university's employee assistance pro program. A 1-800 number was provided. Spring break, Sony thought. Deborah's body must have stayed rotting behind the closed do door of her office through the spring break. Nobody, not a student, not a janitor, not a fellow faculty member had approached the door of her office in that time. Sonia went for, the bottle of the, uh, for that bottle of wine and poured herself a glass. Deborah Polk's death was Deborah Polk's death, and was it so bad? Lots of people died doing their jobs, the jobs they loved. Sonia's life was Sonia's life. She and Deborah Polk had little in common. I'll, I'll stop here for now, and um, if we have more time later, I'll read a few more. Thanks, Lola. Those were wonderful. Um, I do have a, actually a few questions here. Uh, the first one is for Manya. Thank you, Olga. Would you recommend craft books on poetry for Flash as well, or just poetry? Um, ah, 
much do you find that they synergize? Interesting. Poetry. Um, you know, I huh, it's really interesting. I um I think poetry is different. <laughs> for for me, poetry is different. But I mean, first of all, I think it is great for, for a writer to try your hand at all the genres. I mean, poetry, fiction, drama, playwriting. I actually would really recommend playwriting. Um, playwriting teaches you what to do with body on a stage. You with with a play, you really have to uh, you, the, the idea of character, what character is, that that that, that be becomes really embodied. And when we approach fiction, character can be very, um, you know, it's abstract. And it's, it's an abstract idea when, when you're dealing with words, with only words on the page. But when you have a person to control on the stage, that becomes really a, a great skill. Poetry, I find a little bit less helpful, I guess, in my approach to flash though i'm there there's as i said it's a huge range and and um um what one uh writer i would recommend if you're interested in language and flash might be diane williams she, she's a great flash fiction writer and but and her attention to language um is is uh very, you know, it's very precise. And actually, one other writer I will recommend is uh, Peg Alfred Purcell, who I think is also here. I saw her name here earlier. Uh, she's uh, she um, she's the publisher of WTAW Press and of my book. And she herself has two wonderful collection of uh, collections of flash fiction um, out there, and they're they're really marvelous. And they have that attention to language. Um, that that uh, is is very precise. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got a question from Alicia. I wondered if Olga could discuss endings in flash fiction. Short shorts are sometimes compared to prose poetry, and in the case of the latter, poetry more broadly, there's often the recommendation to not tie up a poem neatly at its close. How does this relate to flash fiction, or does it? Um, that's yeah. Thank and thanks, Alicia, for sending that question ahead of time. <laughs> I've had the chance to think about the answer to that. And um, we, you know, we were talking um, about this a little bit earlier. And that, you know, one thing that um, you know is really interesting, I think, in particular about flash, as as relates to this question about endings, is that you know, when you're dealing with a six word flash or a longer hundred word flash, the idea of what's the beginning, the middle of the end, I really, I think has to go out of the window. I mean, really with a six word piece, like is the first word the beginning, the last word the beginning, you know, uh, the last word, the ending, you know, what, what is it really? Uh, and I really like that. I mean, I, I really um, like that thought or where that thought is leading me because we really, the, the approach to fiction and the approach to any sort of fiction, the novel, um, the short story through beginnings, middle and ends, it's, 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 a, it's a useful tool. It's a useful tool in thinking about it. But ultimately I think when it, we consider writing as an art form, it, we have to throw it out somehow. We have to, mm, we have to, I, I mean, honestly, I aspire to write a kind of a work that has no beginning, middle, and end, uh, can be conceptualized in a different way. And, you know, we this is not a new idea either. I mean, you know, when, when we think of Proust or when we think of, um, there's a genre of a novel, usually it's a genre of a novel, right? That's an extremely long story where it's a continuation. Another great novel, there's um, The Man Without Qualities. It's a, an unfinished novel by a German writer uh, um, whose name uh, is escaping me at the moment, but it, The Man Without Qualities is the title. And it's an unfinished book in part because it probably couldn't have been finished. It's it's just he just kept on writing it for years and years. So the yeah, uh, and I think that that idea of a, a story without ending for me is a really <laughs> it's a really exciting one, and it makes my 
you know, me immediately want to try, try again, try, try my hand again at it. At it so. I, I just looked it up. It's uh, an Austrian writer, Robert yes. Musil. Musil. M Musil, yeah. M Musil, Robert yeah. Musil. Uh -huh. So there's a, a question here that sort of dovetails with your response. Mm -hmm. I was asking, Olga, do you find that the stories you want to write naturally gravitate toward a certain length, or does it vary widely depending on your subject matter? Um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, um, well, uh, so um, I, I, I honestly don't know to be honest with that. It, it's, um, it depends. Uh, I think, I think, yes, the, the certain stories dictate their length and then certain stories I approach again and again and try them in different forms in different genres. I, I tell the stories a flash and I um, and I I'm, tell it again and then I um, I tried I, I'm working on a genre uh, sorry on a draft of a novel at the moment and it's you know I, I feel like I'm combining several of my previous attempts um, or several, several of my previous stories into this novel draft but um, the um, one other thing is um, the form does dictate um, the story too in an another way. So people who practice flash exclusively as flash, and there is a, as I said, there is a growing genre of flash fiction, um, and practitioners who are dedicated to it, they um, they will insist that you have to practice flash as its own genre, and then. Um, and if you are dedicated to, to, to it, there's, um, you know, there are riches to be had. Uh, you, you get, you, you get, um, you, you can do more with, with fewer words than you had been at the beginning of the process. And it's a great genre um, as a, as a, in its own form. It doesn't, it's not a small short story. It's not a, um, it's not a, a uh, prose poem, it's not a novel, it's its own genre. And that's a powerful idea too. Um, I will say, I'll add to that. So the workshop that I started the presentation with, uh, the format of the San Francisco Writers Workshop is that you're, you're allowed to read up to six double spaced pages at a time. And um, as I've been going to this workshop over the years, I have, become great at a six page story. I know what it is. I can, I know what stories I can tell in six pages. And I just, you know, I, I think, um, yes, in a way, if you ask me, if you give me a topic and ask me to write something about it, I will produce that six page story first. And then, <laughs> um, and then uh, it can become something else too. But that's, that's sort of become, that's become my unit of thought. <laughs> Olga, we're getting a lot of comments about yeah. how much they loved the stories from Like Water. They're saying things like nice reading. Um, there's some folks that know each other, so they're <laughs> all um, saying hi to each other, <laughs> thanking you. And then we've got a couple of uh, comments. One said, uh, oh, this is Rich. Uh, a writing instructor once told us to end a short story by falling off a cliff, a literary <laughs> cliff. Um, so that they're just wonderful, wonderful comments that are that are coming through. Um, and then um, I've got two more questions for you. And I think it sort of ties in with the fact that you said you, you sort of fit nicely in a six page story. Does writing energize you or exhaust you and I'm kind of wondering if you get energized when you start and then you hit the six page point and all of a sudden oh my god I, I'm done I I'm, I'm sort of exhausted with the with the process uh you know it's, it's both and different different types of writing can uh feel differently I uh as I'm draft the the as I'm drafting the novel I long for the, <laughs> the short story I just I just want to go out of there and have fun um the um the and but 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 with the novel it's it's a it's a different it's a different process and there 
I, as the, the, the deeper I'm going into to this uh, into this this novel, um, uh, the more pl pleasure I'm starting to find in it. Uh, but the the question of uh, it's an interesting question. The one one what uh, the another way to answer it is that when when I write, uh, I feel like I'm producing energy i'm generating energy i i get hot i get sweaty i need i need a lot of food um <laughs> i i like to be you know i just i feel like i feel like i'm an engine uh but it, it's a you know it's it's a, people do describe it as a physical process but uh and this is why also i like flash different stories have their own different energies and um it's it's um and some stories um some stories are just they you know like with well, there's a story you know dandelion in this book that i just had fun with. I, it was it was so much fun to write and i i was you know i i had a very particular i have a very particular memory associated with, with writing it um but um and then others Others, are, yeah, others take work and planning and, and different kind of energy. So, um, yeah, uh, the, the, again, like this is this is why flash too, because you know if you if you get, you know if you bum yourself out, <laughs> you can switch gears. Well, do you think someone could be a writer if they don't feel emotions strongly? Huh? You know that? Hey, that's another great question. So, honestly, so. Uh, I actually had a, I mean, I, I wonder if this comes from my friend Susie. <laughs> no, um, I don't think from me. <laughs> um, because one, one thing, so, you know, I, I, I find, I, yes, I, the answer is absolutely because. Um, well, you Susie can... just responded and said, <laughs> really laughing out loud at the question. Yeah. <laughs> um but um the um the the thing is that um you you know i learn a lot about my own emotions from my writing actually uh, that's that's part where you draft something and then you put it away and then you come back to it and then you see what you've written and then you get to judge yourself or get you to see what 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 had been there and that you may have missed. I'm not a very, I don't, I I was I was brought up in the Soviet Union. I grew up in the Soviet Union. I'm not very much in touch with my emotions. <laughs> I I I really I think the Soviet system was very good about disassociating yourself from from your bodily experience and from your physical experience. I I. As a, as a human being, I feel most strongly when I'm angry and when I'm sad. My, my son made up, a, he, he calls it SMAD when I'm <laughs> sad, <laughs> sad and mad. And, I, you know, I hope I'm not, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, scary that he, he too only feels those two things. But um, anyway, um, um, but yeah. Just a, a couple of, we've got a couple of people saying sure. I'd love it. Uh, <laughs> Cookie also mentions something here. She says that she loved the fact that you know how to put space around your work, writing, but then not looking at it again and again right away. That's a symbol that works in endeavors as well as, uh, as writing. Um, I, I think that's a pretty insightful, insightful statement there. Uh, I just wanted to share with you that we're at the one minute mark and we're out of time for any further questions. Um, but I would absolutely love to thank you um, for being here. Um, it's been wonderful fun. And um, uh, I just wanted to say that it's been a treat with for me and for all of us that you've shared your passion and your expertise with us. We're so grateful you joined us. Um, I'd like to thank uh, two, our interpreters, Cheryl and Nicole, and our live captioner, Kara, much appreciated. Please remember that all audience members will receive an email from us with a link to tonight's webinar recording. 
So if you um, have been interested and want to recall Olga's references to uh, specific magazines or authors, um, then, then you can uh, see the recording of this and, and catch back up. Uh, remember too that these Tiger webinars are available on the RIT Alumni Association YouTube site. The link is in the chat box, so feel free to catch up on past events as well. You can view a full listing of upcoming virtual events at www.rit.edu backslash alumni backslash events. We have several each week and we'd like to include you in as many of these as possible. Our next one is slated for April 13th, 2021, 6 p.m. EST and features Coach Wayne Wilson's RIT Hockey Talk. Uh, Coach will be chatting with alumni Matt Campbell and Scott Bigger as they provide a final update on this year's Tiger hockey season. Talk about two totally opposite ends of, of the spectrum when it comes to, to talking. Um, we've got flash fiction and we've got the Tiger hockey season. Uh, they'll be reviewing highlights of all the playoff action and discuss what, we, discuss what we have to look forward to in the 2021-2022 season. Again, thank you for joining us. Please exit this webinar by simply closing your browser window and do let us know what you thought of the webinar by emailing me, Kelly Redder, that's kelly.redder at rit.edu directly. Have a wonderful week. Stay safe, stay positive, and stay your course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Still have. Good night. Thank you. Cheryl, thank you, thank you so much. Thank Take you. care. Have a great evening. You too. Be well. All righty. I should stop sharing. And yeah, I was just looking at some more of the comments. The neat thing is that in addition to the recording for this program, um, we've recorded all of the comments, we've recorded um, uh, the questions, all of those I can send to you in a document too, so that you've got time to digest. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> well, you recording. were a rock star, you know, Sharon was absolutely right. Uh, it was, um, uh, you are fabulous, and we so enjoyed it. I, I'm just sitting here waiting for you to read another <laughs> one, but... <laughs> Thank you so much. This was so much fun. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And uh, I'll touch base with you in the next week or okay. so. Okay. All right. Thanks. Meantime, go relax, <laughs> have a glass of wine, yeah. <laughs> and, and have a wonderful evening. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.